So, um, The length with quotient field K and um, in all of our tentacles quote. So, uh, the big result here is that if you have any uh, integral domain, then its integral closure, that is the set of everything in the uh, quotient field, that is the root of a monic polynomial, is the intersection of all valuation overrooms of R, right? And last time, That's essentially one direction of it right there. Uh, that, that was easy. The interesting part, of course, is this containment. Right? Why, why is it true that the intersection of all the valuation uh, overrings is equal to the interval? So suppose there exists alpha. And suppose alpha is not so uh, I'm gonna get some kind of dig some kind of contradiction out of this. So suppose I have an element that lives in any any valuation that lives in every valuation, and suppose it's not any more broad. Um, since alpha is not integral over R, then alpha is not in R alpha inverse. Do you all remember this characterization? I, I believe the way I wrote it is U inverse is integral over R if and only if U inverse is in R. Remember that result that we had earlier by playing around, play around with polynomials. And of course, what I've done here is I've replaced U inverse with alpha, right? So alpha's integral over R is only if alpha's in R alpha inverse, right? So if alpha's not integral, then it's not here. Inverse to show it. Alpha inverse, well, that ideal. That's what it means uh, for alpha to not be in here. If alpha doesn't li live here, then that means that the principal ideal generated by alpha inverse in this ring must be proper because it does alpha inverse is a non-unit. Do I agree with that? You may see where we're going with this. Spiral some violation ring. Uh -huh. But then Alpha inverse uh, must survive in some uh, valuation over of R alpha 
in first when two teams are. So my point there is if you have a valuation over ring of this guy, it's certainly a valuation over ring of this. So if W is a valuation over ring, of R, where alpha inverse survives, then alpha is not in the energy conservation. It is alpha supposed to be in energy conservation. Okay. Any questions on this? It's not in W, so what does it have one? Yeah, because um, if alpha is in W, then notice that alpha inverse is in W, of course, and alpha times alpha inverse is one, which means that the ideal generated by alpha inverse would have to have a one in it, which clearly can't survive, right? But okay. Okay. Um, so. This is, I just think this is just the sweetest theorem in the world because, I mean, you would, it's, it's very mysterious to me uh, on the surface of it that uh, being root of some model polynomial has to do with you being in every valuation over it. So let me ask you all this. How many of you have ever heard of invertible ideals? Uh, Dedekind inverts. Uh, So here's my little kind of historical sort of justification for this. Um, so I'm not such a great student of history. I do like my stories, though. Uh, so. So here's kind of the history behind it. Uh, well, one of many, there are many rows of history. This is one of my favorite, uh, while one would care about such things. So uh, how many of you are familiar with Fermat's last theorem, right? It says if you have, and this is, it, this is classical number theory kind of stuff, right? Uh, solving, uh, finding solutions to such equations. This has infinitely many non trivial solutions. Four and equals well. Uh, and by solutions, I mean X, Y, Z. And of course, the, the two cases, you know, that's kind of classical. Uh, actually, when we talked earlier, uh, when we talked about uh, Hilbert's theorem, and I even gave away to parameterize all solutions to this, right? Uh, we came up with that. Uh, for n, uh, Uh, Taylor actually came, or I'm sorry, uh, Andrew Wiles came uh, with a solution 
um, had some problems, right? But it was it was solid. But you know there was details that had to be worked out. He and a former student, Vince Taylor, uh, they kind of fixed it up. But this, of course, wasn't done all once. Classically, n equals three was known. Uh, n equals four. Uh, if you've had uh, some class I taught in the past year, you've probably seen the case of n equals three, maybe n equals four as well. I think I did four. Uh, infinite descent. Uh, so these are kind of classical number theory tricks. Uh, these were known. Uh, and the problem can be reduced. Yeah. No solutions to x to the p y to the p c to the p. Because if there's a non trivial solution to this, right? So if you have x to the n plus y to the n equals e to the n, and non trivial means I, I'm not allowing um, I'm not allowing these to be negatives or zero, right? Because obviously I could have x and z the same and y to be zero, right? Uh, if n equals n prime p, then x to the n prime would be, or y to the n prime would be, or z to the n prime would be. And so if you've got a general bad guy, then you have a bad guy the beef power. So if you can show that there's no solutions to the beef uh, for, for the uh, p prime, or odd prime, then you're you're good to go. Right? Actually, classically, what you need is p is an odd prime, and then to eliminate other things, you need four, and four was done by infinite percent. Okay, what you done so far? Well, um, <clears throat> how to solve this case? Well. In 1847, I believe it was uh, Lamey, one of those crazy accents on his name, uh, found a solution. Uh, using cyclotomic rings of integers. So this is kind of a nice connection of what we did before. This is cyclotomic linear of integers, and Z is joined with a P through U, right? So being further in U to set up whatever you like, right? This is, as it turns out, is the integral closure of Z in our old friend, the cyclotomic extension. This is the splitting field, the polynomial x to the p minus 1, and now take the integral closure of Z in that, right? Um, and this is called ring valve break energy. So he used this, or why would he use this in particular? Well, it's because if you have a ring of integers, then What he did was he threw in a uh, perfect p root of unity, right? So this equation is 
And he used this root of unity to factor this this way. Because this, having the feature of unity, the advantage to this ring of the integers is you now have a feature of unity in it. And this allows you to take that difference between powers and break it down into this product of uh, degree one polynomials, if you will. Okay? Now look, you notice, hey, look, this is a P power. And so you've got P factors in here. And so an argument, and, and I'm glossing over a little bit because you've got to get into it a little bit, but it's like, okay, this is a perfect P power. So in his argument, he used unique factorization to deduce that these are all P powers. And ultimately, he came to the conclusion that this can't happen. But there is a hazard. Anybody see what it is? Let me prove. Dependent on the unique factor basically. Because he needed the elements to factor uniquely. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen. All right. So it's going to fall off the radar a little bit. Certainly, an engineer would like this to happen. Yes, it's not true. For any problem, P greater than or equal to 20. If I all the signal times, but P goes down this. Um, so, oops, didn't work. Now, of course, what he did get is he got us all these cases, but anything that uh, 23 and beyond didn't work. Anymore. Now, just kind of for a uh, fun bit of history, it turns out that they took his proof and kind of adjusted it, fixed it up a little bit, and so this is kind of a historical note, can be fixed for regular primes. That is, primes that do not divide the order of class group. And it makes me sad to say that we probably will, will not quite get the class group uh, in this class, but that's what community algorithm calls for, right? So, anyway, um, so most primes less than 100 are regular. And in fact, this first failing prime, uh, 23, is a regular prime. Uh, the only primes less than 100 that are not regular, I think, are 37, 59, and 67. There's only three less than 100 that are not regular. Uh, however, it turns out, so for model less than solved, here's what's still not solved. It turns out it is known that there are infinitely many irregular primes. 
but it's not known if they're intimately knit regular primes. So it seems that their terminology is a little bit premature, I would say. But anyway, so here, so what happened here? Well, what could have been a proof of Fermat-Lutz theorem uh, working on 200 years ago turned to fail because you do not have unique factorization in particular ring of integers. Now, let me give you a ring of integers where you don't have unique factorization. How about my colleague shows you this in 8510 or gave me an exercise by Kazuma? So, how many of you have seen this, right? Six is two times three. Uh, and it's fairly easy. You can use the norm and you can show that the, the elements of all the two, three, one plus radical negative five, one minus radical negative are all irreducible. So you've got a bad factorization. Everybody okay with that? However, this has unique factorization in time ideals. I'm going to deconstruct this factorization a little bit. So this is going to be my motivation for um, and verbal ideals and dedicated elements. So let me consider some ideals here. Uh, Q. In this ring, R, I'm going to have these, I, I will look at these ideals here. Um, so P is the ideal generated by 2 and 1 plus radical negative 5. Q is the ideal generated by 3. 1 plus radical negative 5, and Q bar is 3, 1 minus radical negative 5. There are a couple of questions that might spring. Do you have any questions about this? Right, right. So what I mean, so this is just a I use this notation to mean sort of the conjugate, right? I mean, actually, oh. if, you, if you think about the action, the, so the Galois group on this is C2, where it swaps it out. This, th these two are automorphic images of each other, right? Um, one question I can think of is why don't I have a P bar? Right? I've got a Q and a Q bar. What about this? This is actually equal to its own bar. Right? Because if I've got these two, then I've got minus two in this, right? When I add minus two to this, I get minus one plus radical negative five, so take the negative of that and I get this. Notice that this is equal to its own P bar, but these two are different, right? Because these two don't vary by three, they vary by two, okay? Uh, another thing that might not immediately be clear is that these are all three proper ideals, right? Uh, how do I know that I don't have a linear combination of these two that is one? Well, I challenge you to sit down and, uh, you know, say, I'll do one. Right? So suppose two plus radical uh, I have that. All right. So I get 2a, um, let's see, what do I get here? Plus c, about b, 
So I'm gonna I'm separating out the radical negative five terms here. I get two a, I get a c, I get a minus five d, and here I get a two b uh, plus c plus d five, and this should be one. Gosh, that's a lot of letters, but do you see the contradiction? C plus D has to be even. Agreed? C minus 5D is odd. Right? Because that equals 1. So if I add these up, I get 2C is odd. Which is positive. Alright. So you can't write 1 as a linear combination. Right? There's a similar proof for these. These are proper ideals. And in fact, but certainly if well, they're not equal to each other, then they, there has to be something left out, right? What's that? If they're not equal to each other, there has to be something left out. Right. I didn't formally show you that they're not left to each other, but yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. So, and in fact, these are all prime. Right. That turns out. Now, let me kind of deconstruct these factorizations here. Uh, I got to do one more computation here, I guess. Well, help. let me point out Let's look at the ideal p squared. Since I didn't bother to convince you that p and p bar are the same, I might as well write it that way, right? Because my generator is a p of this, and it also this as well. This will make things make it a little bit easier. p squared is generated by four. It is generated by two minus two radical negative five. It is generated by two, two radical negative five, and then the product of these gives me six. Everybody agree with that? It's generated by this product all possible classes here. And I claim this is the ideal thing about two. Uh, certainly it is the case that we have this containment here. Uh, right, because notice 2 divides everything in here. All right, so no problem there. What about this case here? That's right. All you have to do for the other containment is to show that the number 2 is in this one, right? 6 minus 4, and there you go. What's Q, Q bar? This is 9, 3 plus 3, radical negative 5, uh, 3 minus 3, radical negative 5, and 6. Can anybody tell what this one is? Uh-huh. And I guess, let's see, what am I going to need? Uh, so let's look at, let's look at PQ. And pay attention to me because I always get this mixed up. PQ is six. It is two plus two radical negative five. It is um, three plus three radical negative five. And it is this, I should have done Q bar. Yes, that would have made my life a little bit easier. 
Uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to be that. So let's do it this way. So it's six. This one's now a minus. Uh, this is still a plus. And then this becomes like six, doesn't it? That's the conjecture. Um, well, how do we do it? Uh, and Yeah, it should be minus. So notice that if I take this and this and add them up, and I've got a six, so I can subtract. I need to subtract off of this too. Actually, the best thing to do, let's just go minus six. Which is that. So if I've got that, it's obviously something. We just got So notice I've got uh, one minus radical negative five in here. Notice one minus radical clearly writes that and that and that. The only thing that I need to test is that it divides this, and I'll do a little slide here. Yeah. 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 So here I'm just going to rationalize. And this is, that's three times six. Over six, which is three, so it's J. Because the quotient is actually in the ring. So, PQ is this. What's that? One plus. That's right. Here's the Galois stuff, right? Just take an automorphic image of this, just do the conjugate to this, and it should be the conjugate of P, which is P, and the conjugate of Q, which is Q, the conjugate of this is this. Now, let's go back to this bad thing here. These elements. This is actually unique prime factorization. It turns out that the ideal generated by six is notice we know that p squared is this and q q bar is this. So the ideal generated by six is the product of these prime ideals, none of which are principal. Right? And notice by rearranging these. This is you get these two principal ideals and rearranging this this way this gives you uh, So these bad factorizations are a bit of a hoodwink, right? Because really at the ideal level, it's the same factorization. You've just reshuffled the cards a little bit, right? 
This doesn't factor into the ideal generated by six does not factor uniquely into principal ideals, but it factors uniquely into prime ideals. And this is the whole motivation uh, for invertible ideals and thinking about this. Dedican domains, so when we get to them, hopefully, Dedican domains are the generalized version of unique factorization domains. Unique factorization domains are really cool because everything that's non-zero, non-unit can be factored uniquely into prime elements. More generally, well, I shouldn't say that because uh, an alternative to that are Dedekind domains. And what happens in Dedekind domains is any non-zero proper ideal can be factored uniquely into prime ideals. So the prime ideals don't necessarily have to be principal. It should be perhaps a little bit surprising also that this ever happens in the first place. Right? You have the product of two ideals that are non principal, and all of a sudden you only need a single generator. In general, you don't expect this to happen at all, right? I mean, if you have a polynomial or any over a field of two variables, and you look at the ideal generated by x, y squared, this is generated by x squared, x, y and y squared, you actually need more generators, right? But here, look what happens. You multiply two ideals that need two generators, and you only needed one. This is an incredibly rare phenomenon. Uh, when you multiply two ideals, they can be principal. It's certainly true for principal ideals, but it's, you know, it's pretty rare in general. So, after all this, yada, yada, yada. So, let me define something uh, here. Let me get started with a couple of definitions. Um, definition 9.1 What are the a domain with quotient field called K Uh, we say an R submodule of K so this is just a submodule so it's inside the quotient field it's an R module we'll call it I is a fractional ideal if there exists a non zero such that a So, for example, how about an example here? Here's a, here's a very large collection. Because here's the deal. Whatever omega is, it's a fraction of two non-zero elements in R, right? By the way, it should be pretty clear, I think, that this is an R module, right? Um, notice that omega R is B over A R. 
Therefore, A times omega R is A, B over A, R, which is BR. And since B is an R, this is contained in R. And in fact, if you have a principal ideal domain, this is what every one of your fractional ideals looks like. It's general, it's more general than an ordinary ideal in that it may not be contained in that. So for an example of the example. Um, something like this. These are fractional ideals of Z. They're not contained in Z. But the idea behind having a fractional ideal is this is, I is contained in the quotient field, so a typical element of I will have a denominator from the ring R. This condition is a finiteness condition. It means that you, what it means to say here is every element of I can be chosen as a fraction with A in the denominator, right? So you can kind of collect the denominators into something that you can use. Here's another example. If R is a domain and I in R is an ordinary ideal, then I is fractional. So any ordinary ideal is fractional ideal, and here you can put A to be one. Um, here is the next definition. Let R be a domain. Or I'm sorry, I'll be a fractional ideal. Well, we have the quotient field of A. And I, a fractional ideal. Or. Um, we define some books may this is really the traditional notation for this, although some books might use a colon notation, um, but they use it for sort of a more general thing. This is a set of K in the function field such that K I is contained in R. Yeah, so let me misprint my notes. I think I'm going to fix that. This is correct. So it's a KI, it's an R. Um, when we say I inverse. Uh, I'm going to make a remark here. No. When you take any element of I and multiply it by something in I inverse, you have to be an R by the definition of I inverse. All right, and so, so of course, a, a general element uh, in here is in form. Well, it's generated by elements alpha, beta, where alpha is an I and beta is an I invert. So, a general element is some alpha I beta I. So, notice anything in I times anything in I inverse is contained in R. If I I inverse is equal to R, we say. I is inverse. Um, 
So this exists in a bunch. Let me give you an example here. Um, if omega is to k uh, zero and i is equal to omega r, anybody want to take a wild guess as to what i inverse is? Fantastic. Notice that everything of the form omega inverse r, when you hit this, it's back into r. And i, I inverse equals omega r, omega inverse r, which is r. So the gist of this example is any uh, principle non-zero ideal inverse. Can anybody give an example? Okay, so I'm wasting everybody's time if this is a fancy definition of principal ideas, right? It's always good when you make a definition to come up with an example. Uh, is there an example of an ideal that's verbal that's not principal? Those ideals we were just playing around with, uh, I mean, it seems very clear to probably have Actually, he brought a whole new word. I'll just pick on this one. Notice that we already have so. So I slipped my one half into one of these P's. Check this out. If you have the ideal two, one plus radical negative five, the ideal one. Not only is every product here inside of the ring, but in fact it equals. And uh, actually, that's a, that's an equivalent way to think about uh, this. So let me give you this proposition here. Nine point three point four. Uh, but I'll be fractional. But I'll be fractional ideal. Uh, following conditions are equivalent. Number one, I is verbal. Two, there exists an ideal J contained in R non-zero ideal, of course. And I do mean an ordinary ideal such that IJ So this is another way to tell something it's verbal if you can find another ideal that multiplies it and makes it a principal ideal. Uh, then you're good to go. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Oscar, any questions out there? All right. Well, we will see you all next time.